Hello. <clears throat> Hi, Caroline. How are you? Ah, uh, there they are. Uh, yeah, I was just here with other people, and then I wasn't anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't anywhere. You were just in a in I, limbo? Well, I, I thought I was here, but I guess <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> yes. Hey, okay. everybody. <laughs> right. uh, here he comes. Oh, there's Marco. Yeah, he's the one that kicked us all off. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if he's even coming. I don't. I didn't confirm. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Testing one, two, three, four. Yes. Is that better? That's, yeah, that's, better. that's better. It's yeah. better. Okay. It's better. Is it as good as usual? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, actually. Uh -huh. Okay. Good. <clears throat> Sorry, I just ate lunch, so. <laughs> I just had dinner, so. <laughs> um, who would like to like? Ah, uh, John. <clears throat> Greetings. Okay. Hi, John. I think the gang's all here. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell the weekend? So uh, since I introduced the topic, I just want to open it up to wh whoever uh, wants to talk. I think the questions suggested in the post are great. I just finished reading the paper this morning, so it's all very fresh. Um, yeah. Who, who wants to kind of lead off with a conversation, uh, with a question or something that they found they really wanted to talk about? Well, could I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, so why did you propose the topic? Because I wanted um, a, a uh, reading group <laughs> to support me in reading this thing that I had committed myself personally to reading. So, yeah, I was obviously curious about uh, Democracy Earth as it pertains to um, <clears throat> what they're building as it pertains to potentially being, uh, you know, that Cosmos would be built on or off of that or branching off of that or something. So I was curious about it, um, but I really didn't have much, much knowledge going into it apart from knowing about Pia Mancini's body of work. Mm. And Pia Mancini being one of the uh, collaborators or one of the participants in, in writing this, this document that, as you know, I mean, mm -hmm. for the benefit of anybody watching this, you know, I, I think we, we should probably state that we're not associated with democracy.earth or anything like that. And this is just a conversation about mm -hmm. this, this piece of writing because it's interesting to us and to you. And so I, I actually have just a couple big framing thoughts I might put out uh, because this is just a conversation. As far as I'm aware, none of us are uh, experts in computer science, computer scientists, blockchain experts, Bitcoin experts, etc. Jeffrey might surprise us yeah, as he is wont to do. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're approaching this as essentially laymen, right? Uh, and, you know, but we're all educated in various ways. We're all conversant with various uh, disciplines or discourses. And so part of what I think maybe we could start off with is just seeing like what we got out of like how we relate and maybe trying to discern like what's the right scale or level of analysis for this. Because if we go talking about like blockchain versus some other kind of chain, whole chain or whatever, we might get lost in kind of technical weeds. And there are some really, I think, relevant big picture questions or issues raised by the paper. Uh, including how it was written, which I think is interesting in and of itself and the sort of ambitions and intentions embedded in here. But there are those bigger questions like, you know, questions about sovereignty, about the nation state, about the internet, about democracy in a time of, you know, very, you know, accelerating technological change that we probably could have some um, fruitful perspectives on uh, w with this group. Uh, so I, I'd be curious to find like where are those places where we could actually increase our understanding or um, you know get some kind of uh, collective intelligence effect you know going through combining 
our perspectives on this artifact that we've studied. So does that sound cool? Mm. Well, I, I, let, could we invite, let, if I may invite Jeffrey to start because he articulated the most uh, articulate questions with respect to the piece uh, and Ed as well uh, in, in, um, in discussion with him on, on the forum topic. And um, perhaps, you know, we could pick one of the higher level questions there, Jeffrey, and uh, you, know, you, you, you could begin by uh, stating it and um, you know, leading us in, in a direction that might be might be fruitful and collaboratively um, generative. Okay, I didn't actually have the questions in front of me. Hang on, let me get, okay, here we are. Um, so, the, I mean, the first question, I, and I, I get your point, Marco, about the technicalities of it, and we don't want to get into the technicalities. But I have to say right off the bat that I don't understand blockchains. So, I, I get that Bitcoin has this, incorruptible or seems to have this incorruptible aspect to it which is why there are why it's become such a popular monetary system but i don't really understand how it is incorruptible and the other thing the other part of that question is because the article presents a much larger system that incorporates blockchains and yet the article seems to claim that the system as a whole is incorruptible and not just the blockchain structure itself. And that seems to me less clear from what the article is saying. It seems to be essentially loading up a bunch of different mechanisms to manage this kind of governance structure. And I'm not sure that the sum of all those different mechanisms necessarily makes an incorruptible structure, even if the blockchain itself is presumably incorruptible. So that's, that's a, a question. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so there's a, I think there's a starting point there. There's questions about the, the technology stack uh, and whether that stack, by, by stack meaning layers of technologies like Bitcoin right. on top of, um, you know, a uh, voting uh, system and a particular yeah. way well, to define social contracts and all of these different issues, right? Right. But then there's the bigger question of the actual if intended effect of the democracy itself, that being incorruptible if the component parts, like the blockchain part of it is, right. is not. So, so okay. So for instance, go. they had this thing where because they say it's incorruptible and they have all these mechanisms in there for stopping people from like being over to, to re override a vote that somebody else has done that you've delegated to somebody else, but then you disagree with what they've done. And so you can re override it. So that was clearly an approach trying to gain a certain level of incorruptibility. But it seems to me, that if somebody, a big guy is leaning over me and says, you're going to vote this way, I'm going to vote what the big guy says, <laughs> you know, not regardless of what the technology tells me. So, <laughs> and the problem with democracies and voting is there are a lot of big guys with sticks running around yeah. during some of these elections. So. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, can I can I uh, pick up on that uh, uh, right there? I think one of one of the interesting things I found about uh, reading this paper is that, um, especially there, there, I think there's two parts to the paper. There's the the first part, which is the like the general setting of why would we want to do this in general, and then there's the second part, and it's the larger part of the paper that says this is how we go about ensuring that we can do what we think we do. And that's the technical side of it. And in both of those, there are, there are a large number of presuppositions that are made, a lot of assumptions that are made, that if those assumptions are true, then certain things follow from them. Uh, one, one of the things that it does not assume is exactly what Jeffrey just pointed out. And it, for me is, the, is one of the key assumptions, what do you do about the people with the big sticks? <laughs> because 
it's like they don't exist inside the technology. But you have to get into the technology before the technology becomes effective. So there's this, there's, there's nowhere in there that I see that we get from the technology to reality. Mm -hmm. Because um, at an organizational level, for example, we could decide amongst ourselves that for the Cosmos co-op, co we'll institute a voting system where everyone who is a member can have a say on what it is that we do and, and how things are done. And, and that's perfectly valid. And it could also be that the technologies that are outlined here um, would help us do that in some way that enables us to be sure that each of us is expressing his or her own will in, in the way that they intend to do that. Even if you're delegating votes, which I have a problem with to begin with, that's the, I call it the Alabama syndrome. Um, down there for years, it was acceptable to vote for your dead parents because you knew how they would vote. <laughs> so votes were allocated to others, <laughs> even though, even though and, and they were reliable as well. I'm sure that's how the parents would have voted. But it completely skewed the system because not everyone had just, not everyone had dead relatives that they could fall back on, for example. So, so within the system itself, I think we could assume that the technology is as they say, even if we're not experts in the technology. And if we, as, if we work on the assumption that these, these let's say, cryptographic and, and security-based uh, features are, are accurate and and implementable, that's fine. But we have the larger issue of how do, how do we get that impl implemented? I know that they would like to do this on a global scale because everybody needs to be heard, but we live in systems where very few people are heard. So, so how do you get heard? That, that, that's, for me, the biggest step. How do, how do you even start at any level bigger than just, let's say, a group like ourselves? And that because that makes all the difference in the world if you want to make this scalable to some, some larger, larger domain. And, and it's actually moot how secure it is if you never get there. We, can, we could test it out. We could prototype it on a small scale. But how do you, how do you get it to a larger scale if, if those who, are, who have the sticks don't want the system? That's, that's the big problem getting in as far as I, I see it. I, uh, can I chime in? I, I, I laugh because I come from Alabama. I, I know. That. <laughs> <laughs> A banjo on my knee. <laughs> uh, how did your How did your relatives vote in the last one? <laughs> <laughs> they all voted for George Wallace. <laughs> I bet they did. <laughs> I'm from again if you were alive. Um, so. I guess the way I would like to read this, well, first of all, I would like to be, I want to be at peace with what is happening. Mm -hmm. So I'd like, for, so for this session to be really you, valuable for me, it's like neighbors on the porch in rocking chairs, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe someone opens a beer, that's fine, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I, I am very interested in, um, balancing uh, the very fast beta um, out there, um, conscious mind, with the, the long now, the slow rhythms, the rocks and the trees and the elders. And this, this um, paper, as compelling as some of it is, seems to me to it wants to move beyond the nation state and claims that our technology has produced the networked individual that is ready to move on. But it seems to me, and you guys may take, read this differently, but the, the nation state provides a narrative, a compelling narrative for collective identity, not personal identity. Each of us as a networked individual may have to figure that out for him or herself, but the collective identity. And it seems to me that if we want to move beyond 
the nation state, we have to come up with a better narrative than this, mm -hmm. um, which I don't, which I, I, I found some things in it that seems to me, well, what level is this paper coming from? It seems to me um, very technocratic, very driven by the fast. And speed is very important to the, the persons who put this paper together. I just want to quote, let me find this quote. Um, Politics moves at glacial speeds. Nothing seems to happen until a strenuous noise gets everyone's attention. It is slow because it often takes one generation to die for the next one to take over. And today we live in a world that has the offline generation in charge and the online generation growing up. Um, so obviously the value here is speed and slow, Speed is good, slow is bad. Um, and it also pits an online generation against an offline generation, which to me sounds extremely confusing. Because I, I, I hang out with 90 year olds and they're online. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anyone who isn't online except for those who are in deep coma. Oh. And they may be online too. <laughs> <laughs> I get the impression uh, they are, John. <laughs> I'm just concerned that there, we, we may have a lot of networked individuals who don't have any friends. Um, I worry about myself, by the way, because I, I just assume I, I ended so many long-term friendships because, you know, people's uh, smartphone, they pick it up and interrupt. Excuse me, I have to take this call. And after enough of those, I just said, you know, go ahead, take the call. You know, I'm going to go wash the dishes or do something else. And I just, uh, you know, when I was invited out again, I just said, I got a, I got better things to do. Sorry. Um, so I, um, I'm just wondering about since we're living in this time of of narrative collapse, that um, Bitcoin and blockchain and um, all of these innovations that are coming out of, I think, the problem states produced by the technology is going to uh, offer us any meaningful uh, alternative. Anyway, that's my two cents. I would like to read this integrally as we um, look at past sessions that we've had and we've been um, drawing upon different authors and persons that we've been studying together. I think it'd be interesting to review Carrie Welch and Mark um, uh, Michael Garfield's interview when they talked about um, where they talked about this issue of of um, different brainwave states from I think it beta alpha more relaxed more internally generated imagery uh, self reflexive story time to the theta which is you know d deeper immersion in inner internal states and then of course you have delta which is, you know, well, that, that I guess corresponds in the Gebser uh, vocabulary as, as the archaic, mm -hmm. but that all of these brainwave states, we're, we're recycling them throughout the day. And we can hopefully in the integral stage, um, look at the, the, the you know, the, 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 the mental stages into past, present, future, that dynamic. Um, whereas the mythical and the magical or into other aspects of, of, our, of our nature. But the integral seems to be able to handle all of them in effective ways. So you can have a past, present, future, and you can have a subjective sense um, that is not connected to clock time. And I just find a lot of this paper seems to be coming out of um, clock time. And it doesn't seem to have made that leap into the integral, uh, integral fourth dimension, fifth dimension, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, that's my complaint. Otherwise, I would say I don't know enough about the technical stuff to make any sort of critical estimation about any of this. But what I can, can register is my gut, gut response. And I just thought that particular paragraph just sounds um, extremely unintegrated. The one that said, um, talked about the 
um, the, the glacial speeds of current politics. Some things you just can't rush. I worry about the speed, 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 speed is better. I, and I, I live in a fast city, so I know that, that pace, it can be very, that, that kind of momentum can be very, um, create a tremendous stimulation. I think it also creates a, a pseudo sort of excitement that is, is masking an enormous exhaust. I'd, I'd love to um, piggyback off of that comment, if I may. Um, I, I think I get the sense that the speed is partly a response to how powerful these new technologies are. It's an anxiety over who gets to use them. And if we don't come up with, a, it's kind of an anxiety around if we don't come up with a way for the people to apply these technologies in a way that protect their power, who knows what the future might hold. And um, what, it's a very interesting field, especially with respect to in the um, technological development around computer science and things, because um, you have a, a whole hacker culture um, and an open source culture where, pe where people feel very strongly that technology should be developed for people, for the purpose of them realizing <laughs> themselves or, or whatever. It, it should not be developed for weaponized uses. However, any new capacity, any new power um, that hum humanity can, you know, corral often does get used for weaponized uh, purposes when it's used by consolidated power. So I see the urgency in these authors. I see it as their sense that if we don't move immediately to um, toward uh, like an, an actual democratic, truly democratic system with integrity, um, then, you know, they fear the outcome. That's the implicit thing in this in the paper. Um, but I think the point about you know, without a narrative that actually ties people together, the voting is kind of meaningless. Um, uh, I think that's really important to remember that you can't just toss out a nation state or any sense of identification in kind of a fam familial or a community sense, um, that narrative of who we are as a people um, and, and have uh, any integrity to the structure, you know, um, any integrity to the voting. I, I was thinking as you were speaking too that like any action that we take in reality, any decision that has material impacts on each other um, is a historical narrative, creates a historical narrative. Um, so, so far we've had narratives of consolidation of power um, and concentration of power and how that power gets exerted leverages kind of the mythos of nation states and of certain identities um, to validate itself, um, to validate, you know, wars and things like that. Um, and I, I'm often struck with just how little power, <laughs> uh, and, and in the paper, I believe they say, uh, ill liquidity is the major barrier to human expression of freedom today. I thought that was really interesting because each of us has very little power. Um, and even our vote, as they unpack in the paper, has very little power because it you know there's all these inefficiencies all these corruptibilities in the in the existing system um which all of that stuff i found really interesting because i generally I, I agree with it that we, that we could be doing better um and so you know what what is the power of of us to um freely like liquidly um actualize ourselves and have and have uh, our own values and meanings be attached to the act of voting or of taking action in a political sphere um, more, more with a higher degree of fidelity. That's something that's very interesting to me. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know. I certainly have concerns too about this method, but I think there it's, it's actually, it's pretty exciting. I don't know. <laughs> it's, but it needs the, the, the narrative development too. It needs, it's not just the technological, you know, wow factor. It has to also be, wow, this is powerful. Where could we go with this? And, and then the question of where do we want to go with this? Who are we that define, you know, what we want? Because acts, actions create a historical strata, historical narrative. 
but the meaning attributed to those actions is justified according to those external myth mythological narratives. Um, and so, you know, the reason that the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima, like that, that event is, creates a historical strata in terms of who lives and who dies and who gets to reproduce and things like that. But it, it's justified according to the, the point in time and the narratives that predominate in time that led to that action being justified um, according to those who held power. So, so yeah, so yeah, what does it mean? I, I think asking the question of what it means to have power and why, why we would want a more liquid, a more, you know, collaborative, a more uh, distributed uh, system of power is important. And I don't think that gets addressed enough in the paper. Like, why do we want <laughs> yeah. a more distributed uh, system of power? What does it say about us that we would want that? Like, who is the us in this paper? Right, I'm on centralization, decentralization, peer to peer. Um, I think it's slow and fast, not slow or fast. Um, definitely, they, we all should feel a sense of urgency about the state of the oceans and you know the running out of fossil fuels. There's enormous urgency. I, I can't imagine anyone doesn't feel it right now. Um, but I think the, the power of the long now and, you know, that kind of energy of the slow gives direction to the speed and the fast and the innovative and the fashion and the tweet of the day. And I, I, I do believe it's very problematic when we have the liquid democracy that could produce a, someone like Donald Trump as president who lives in, you know, the, that sort of tweet world, the tweet of the day. That's how he's pretty much running his administration. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I really liked what you said, but, but you said something about this excited you. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that, Caroline, what that is? I didn't, I didn't quite get it. Sure. Um, let, me, let me see. Well, what excited me in the paper um, was around um, a few things. I think the social validation piece of how people validate other people in this system, um, that's, that's interesting. It actually explicitly says that AI is not appropriate for that, that that's really a social and that kind of maybe feeds into the trust question, which I really want to get to is that question of, that was raised in the forum about trust. Um, Cause yeah, but, but uh, you know, how we, we in relationship validate each other, that that's, um, that was interesting. And then just the idea that um, the votes could be like, what would this, like if we actually gave liquid voting power on any matter of common concern to every every human being, sentient human being, we'll say above the age of 15, on the planet today, what stories would those votes tell about the will of the people? Like, I'm really interested in that. I'm really fascinated by that. And I think that the ways in which gerrymandering and voter fraud and all these different techniques that are used to, to actually manipulate votes in current systems, like in the examples given in the paper, the US and Argentina, um, you know, the story doesn't really filter up. It doesn't filter out. It doesn't like the story of what people want isn't really acted on. It's the, I, the, the lens of how politicians seek to perpetuate their professional role, their political position um, makes sense to me. And I'm curious what would happen if we let people speak their values almost speak their peace in a direct way and if you took the data that that produced and you looked at the patterns in it um what would that tell us about the the kind of collective consciousness i'm fascinated with with that uh possibility so i'm gonna hand i want to hand it off to other folks who haven't spoken as much thank you can i throw something uh, in here because i think it ties in with the something that both caroline and john were saying and I'd also like to read a quote from the, from the text. And it's the very first paragraph, the, the, their starting point. 
and where they say that, you know, current uh, democratic systems governing societies under the territorial domain of nation states have grown stagnant in terms of participation and are leading towards increased polarization. Okay, but now the, the part comes. Constituencies are provided with tailor-made media that satisfies their own endogamic beliefs, pulling society apart as discourse and factual debate are replaced with a post-truth mindset. This is something that comes out, I think, very clear in Jordan Brown's film. And I would like to know what in this paper addresses that. Nothing. Nothing at all. It's, it's in the mindset going in. We can't create, narratives will be written about what happened, just like we are writing them about Hiroshima. We weren't there, we had, but the narrative's being written after the fact. We don't write the narrative as we're going along, at least not the one that anybody that needs to read it is reading. So how do we address, and because their next um, 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 statement in here is, there is a consequence of the dramatic expansion in communication channels that shrank attention spans. Well, it's not like it happened and it's not happening anymore. They are continuing to shrink. Okay, rendering thoughtful analysis expendable. So we are living in an online world, let us say, according to the author's own statement, where thoughtful analysis has, is considered or has become expendable. What are we doing to address that? And that, because that's what I see that we are doing here in Cosmos. We're at least trying to <laughs> keep our heads above this water of uh, instantaneous whatever it is so that we can have a thoughtful conversation about something and maybe find some meaning in what it is that we're doing and others may be doing. And I don't, and, and of, you know, that's why I said at the beginning, assume all that technical stuff works. It doesn't matter if you don't address this. How, how do we address this part? Because, and this is where John comes in, you know, well, we do have to slow down. And we do have to get on the porch and rock. And we do have to think before we speak. And we, we do have to do all those things that were just everyday normal when I was growing up and are not everyday normal anymore. I know, that's, that's how it, I try to get my grandson to slow down. It's not always easy, but that's the, those are the things that we have to be do, uh, have to do and have to be doing. And, and I don't see those being addressed in this. In, in this. And, and that's where I think before we can even think about, is it good, bad, or indifferent if everybody has a say, we kind of have to figure out, well, how do, we, how do we approach those issues? And how do we approach that in order to establish a foundation so that we could actually build something? Because right now, and that's the problem I have with most IT-based thinking and solutions, it's foundationless. And so it ends up imploding on itself or it collapses or, you know, it's not thought through enough or, or whatever, however you want to describe its failures. That's why, that's why it doesn't work in the end the way that we would like it to because we are, we're missing the foundation. And that's, that's where we have to start, I think. Mind if I speak up? Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. And if you aren't loud enough, yell. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll attempt to answer your question, but I, I do think the paper answers it, but there's no official answer just yet. Right? We're all kind of trying to solve that uh, issue of like, how, how do we rein in intelligent conversation through our technology and yeah, the Jordan Brown film, which I will expect is going to be a great discussion. This directly ties into it in a lot of ways. Um, I, I want to share kind of as a tangent and hopefully I'll rein it back in, but my very first, I've kind of explained who I am. My very first political writing was right after uh, the election. And this is a, a Doug mine thinking here about what, what might come out of the, the Trump um, presidency. And I, I was trying to come up, like, see the good in it. I, I, my heart didn't like fall out of my body and explode or my mind didn't explode. I, but I said, oh, this is uh, going to be a big change here. And I was trying to imagine how the collective in a certain sense would be involved 
um, with this man with such a big ego. And my first thought was his Twitter feed. Like, can we not, can we kind of talk him into promote, like, I imagine he would want to get it like worldwide um, fame, basically. So I thought maybe maybe he could use his Twitter feed to um, spark the vote, get people involved, or the people around him would say, "Hey, let's let's talk about this issue. Should we go to war with North Korea? Let's let's vote here." Type of thing. Um, obviously, that's not going to work. That's going to bring in the rabble and <laughs> promote rubble. <laughs> so, um, so it, it's going to be a lot of trial and error, I believe. And th this paper, one of the big factors about it is that it is an open project. So if, if you have an idea about how we can use technology for the better and not let Facebook take us over, then you can edit that in this paper at some point. Um, but th there are a lot of small pockets Every, popping up everywhere. Most of them are going to fizzle, as you mentioned, whatever it was, the pirate party seemed, they, they couldn't even kind of articulate what they were about, but they, they said, oh, it sounds like a good idea. But then you have um, in Iceland, you have uh, the guy, um, John Narr, I think it was, it was his name, it's the mayor. Uh -huh. uh, can't pronounce the name, but he, he essentially ran on satire and got elected just because people wanted something different. Like he said, everybody gets a towel, a free towel at the pool, or uh, kids will get a polar bear at the, at the zoo like they've wanted. Uh, but he won and he's found ways to get the collective to be involved. So that's, that's a successful mission there. Um, so as John was saying, like how, how are we to integrate all these little bubbles Kind of slow down and involve everybody and that, that's a big question but technology is what a lot of people are noticing coming we're all kind of coming to that conclusion that technology for better or worse is bringing us together so what what the paper talks about is being able to directly um utilize technology before it's taken over by someone else at this point um which in a lot of ways it has been. And so, I, yeah, I'm having a lot of trouble with the paper, um, but just the fact that it's open to revision. I, I, I imagine in 10 or 15 years, if this paper is still being focused on, uh, it, a lot of the Bitcoin stuff might be scratched. Um, who knows, but uh, I'll stop there. So I wanted, there's a couple of things I wanted to say um the um so one of the things that the article does do is it does a critical analysis of existing electronic voting systems mm. and so part of the argument that it's making is we have a problem folks because the existing organization of electronic voting systems is fatally flawed and so this blockchain approach is an attempt to bring in something that will deal with some of the flaws in the existing. And I, I do think, although, you know, I also, I'm very, you know, and as I, my comments already remarked, I'm very sympathetic to a, a more critical perspective on this. And I think Johnny's remarks are right on the button too, about the, the, the long now and the need to be, to have a different dialogue in here. But I do think that the criticism of existing governance systems in the electronic world is tangible, real, and needs to be addressed and done so relatively quickly because the dangers to the society that we live in are huge if we don't address that. So, um, there is also the paper has a very systems oriented approach, which actually I liked the systems oriented approach within it. It's, you know, I tend to be a systems thinker. So I don't think, so it's, it's not so much focused on one tool, but it's a collection of tools that are organized into a system. So you may criticize them parts of the system, but the sort of 
systems vision here, I, I do think is interesting. Um, the other, but the thing that still, uh, so coming back to the, the curmudgeonly side of things, <laughs> the, it's it's because if we look at Bitcoin, what is really really disturbing with Bitcoin, and I'm sure I'm not the only one on this group that thinks this, is that the people who are most interested in Bitcoin are organized crime, and the sort of organized violence groups. Wall Street is very interested in Bitcoin. That's yeah, Jeffrey, that's what Jeffrey did. Right <laughs> the author, wait a minute. The authors here say that that Bitcoin has been an undeniable success. I know, but but to whom? <laughs> <laughs> it's an undeniable oh, success to all the power. To Wall Street. Here. That's what Jeffrey just said. I agree with him. <laughs> and so, what are we? You know, if so, I worry about the perverse sides of a blockchain approach in another area. If we already have a perverse side, a Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah. You know, when they came up with this thing, I think they thought this would be a ethical approach to doing money. And look at what's happened. It's yeah. not. Right. So it's not it. incorruptible. No. Not yeah. ethically yeah. incorruptible. No. Humans are not. <laughs> it is technically exactly. incorruptible, but not yeah. ethically incorruptible. Somebody <laughs> will hack anything, yeah. any yeah. design that ever gets created, somebody will hack it, you know? So much, so much naysaying, sure. so much naysaying. On this <laughs> no, no, no. What's going on? There's, I mean, but, but, I mean we have, a, I think Jeffrey's right. I mean, we have a problem. So uh, the, uh, at the very least, they're trying to address a real problem. Can we uh -huh. agree on that much? Do we, we agree. There is a diagnosis here of existing or legacy systems which for the most part were developed what 18th century right into the 19th century for a certain speed of communication socially for a certain capacity technologically for a certain population size and density and those conditions have changed profoundly in the last two three hundred years now. Um, even more so in the last 40 40 years and 20 years so uh, I totally agree, you know, hear and feel and agree with the point about the theta and the delta waves and the narrative dimensions needing to be a part of this. I, I don't think that they're, they're not explicitly addressing the narrative dimension. They're implicitly, though, because democracy is a narrative. Democracy has an ancient uh, you know, historical narrative. Uh, the very front of this picture is, what's that? Mm. Parthenon, right? Parthenon, mm. Uh, and so is there, I, I would argue that although it's not told really fully here, there is a grand narrative that has to do with democracy, has to do with um, a planetary civilization uh, over and above or beyond nation state centric civilization. Uh, <laughs> and I would also, uh, I think, want to highlight that there are some ontological and metaphysical assumptions in this paper that are part of a grand narrative, like the idea of an individual person being the unit of uh, mm -hmm. sovereignty in this is fundamental. And so then, then you get to the question of identity. Everything in this system hinges on an equivalence of identity between the individual embodied human sentient person as we define that in a certain meta narrative and the power that's distributed to that entity via the dripping mechanism and, and validated uh, on this distributed ledger or, or blockchain you know, tied to Bitcoin somehow as the sort of computing engine behind it. So I would, you know, I would be curious to investigate that narrative. See, is that a sufficient narrative for the kind of uh, innovations that this group is proposing and this, this isn't, these are not just, you know, your average hackers kind of working out of a college dormitory or something. I mean, they have support from some you know, big institutions. Uh, the back page, you have the World Economic Forum, TED, Berkeley, MIT Technology Review, Fast Company, Singularity University. There, there's a certain cultural sort of milieu that is shaping this discourse, I, I would say. And 
I, I think that part of what Ed and Johnny and the curmudgeonly side of, of Jeff perhaps are reacting to is, is, is that milieu uh, and uh, potentially some, you know, discomfort with the, the, the feel of it, the, 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 the quality uh, of it. And is there a way that we could acknowledge what, you know, what's true and good here, but add that, that integral or that holistic or whatever you want to call it, that inter interior paranormal slow time mm. dimension to it. Uh, do you, you use the word planet, planetization. Planetary, I think I used. You said planetary. As, as part of their, which is, you're calling their grand narrative. I didn't get that. I got globalization. Mm -hmm. Seems to be very neoliberal. Those are different. Planetarization, mm -hmm. which I think is a different, a different um, meta narrative. And so I, I also think they're talking about humanity changing by that can, technology will change humanity. And I'm very, that part of the narrative, if that's what you're calling, doesn't work for me. I think I'm quoting Jane Roberts, the, the life and death of the of American cities. She said, what holds civilization together is the sidewalk. People are walking down the sidewalk, they see a stranger, they smile, they lift their hat, they walk on by. And it's those kinds of exchanges on the street between strangers that actually stabilizes entire communities. And then you have the shopkeeper who's out there sweeping the sidewalk. And, you know, there are a thousand eyes, she said, on the street watching what's going on. When the kids come in, you know, if an old person needs some help with the groceries. And I, I just uh, very much question this whole idea that uh, we just need bigger, better, faster technology. Um, I think I, um, if that's the meta narrative here, I'm saying thumbs down. <clears throat> I think we need to get out of our cars and we need to, you know, reclaim the streets and, uh, you know, throw away our fucking smartphones and start like, like you say often, Marco, love the one you're with. <laughs> they may not be perfect, but they're better than anything you're gonna get on, a, on a, an exchange on a smartphone. And, I'm so, and I've said otherwise, other ways, I think we can go utopian and we can go dystopian. I'm not saying those are the, necessarily the good old days, um, but I think they're, they, uh, uh, I think what we're seeing is um, if we could balance, find a balance between the, the long now and uh, this innovation craze that I think we're going through um, so that we could um, find a direction, we might be able to salvage democracy. But right now, I think there's, since there's no one, you know, there's no one to vote for anywhere, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, th this is sort of like the, the, the what, what this paper is investigating is to me not at, a, at the right level. It's not the kind of discourse I think that's going to move any mountains. It's just working at, you know, our capability to uh, maneuver a little bit uh, on one level. But I don't think it's going to produce um, people that we want to go out and vote for necessarily. And I believe that it's missing very much um, it, it says, I'm just quoting it because I don't, got, don't want to get too far away from the text because, you know, we all read it in different ways, obviously. Um, but I, what stuck out for me, the incorruptible nature of blockchain transactions provides an incentive for people not to lie. Hence, organizations storing votes and decisions in um, are then, then become driven by facts rather than promises. I just want to say, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to not want to lie. Um, I think that every politician and every person and every even statesman learns there's something you're going to present and there's something you're going to hide. And this is just human nature. And if you think uh, somehow we're going to become fact-driven overnight, 
I doubt it. Mm. We will constantly look for facts that su support our values, and we should. And we're going to ignore the facts that don't support what we value. And that's what politics seems to me all about. It's about affect, it's about gesture, it's about tone of voice. And it's drama, it's performance art. And I think that's, so I'm very, quest I question this. Um, so that's my two cents. <laughs> and I hope you vote for me. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So only, only if you have a, do you have a smartphone? Only if you have a smartphone, I'll, I'll vote for you. I just turned it off. <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I would love to respond. Uh, so I, I want to respond to something that was said earlier, I think by Ed about technology is foundationless and also to what John just said about um, technology like is the way unto itself or something that that is problematic. Um, I want to point out that technology does shape humans. It is shaping us right now <laughs> by virtue of this event occurring even. Um, but it, it shapes by providing certain affordances. Each system designed for a user to interface and interact with provides some affordances and prevents some other activities from occurring. And all of these platforms that we use and have become accustomed to, including the globalized monetary system, are designed by certain programmers for certain purposes. Now, you know, Robert Anton Wilson in the 80s said that the future would be owned and controlled by programmers, that all human beings, if we were at all smart, all human beings would have a universal basic income and we would all be programmers. Because if we're not programming, <laughs> like the systems with which we interact, we are being, you know, infringed upon in some ways. Um, and that you can look at that in terms of democratic powers or lack of powers, right? Um, and, uh, I think what the democracy.earth paper is proposing is a technological, is, is a technologically um, based system that would be uh, a serve, that would serve a certain purpose of humans for this kind of liquid distributed democracy. If that is a purpose of humans, there's the question around that, but, and it would, the technology, the interaction of the technology would help us, would, would amend our process of striving toward a, an ideal democracy um, and it would actually kind of be um, a, a technological asset to the fulfillment of that potential. Um, you know, when I think about what the internet is and what the different platforms and interfaces like what they actually enable is certainly a connection of minds, the connection of humans to better understand themselves and their situation. I think that that's what our conversation is right now, or that's what it could be. Platforms that are predominant like Facebook are oriented towards advertising revenue because they're oriented towards billionaire outcomes because they're part of this, you know, endemic system that we have, status quo system that we have today. But you can design for other purposes, you know, and we could, we could entrain Behaviorally, the thing about an interface is it entrains behavior. You know, I know to put my headphones in and, you know, to hit the mute and the unmute button when I want to interact on the, in this interface, right? Um, so it enables and it constrains. And so, you know, what are we, what are we designing for? And I think, is there a, a silent majority <laughs> in the sense of a global, you know, in terms of the seven point whatever billion people on the face of the earth, is there a silent desire for, for a, a more uh, power in the form of democracy. And so would the creation of the technology, in this case, the democracy earth that we're looking at, the system, would it um, end up shaping possible behaviors and shaping behaviors of those who interact with it? And is there enough people in the world, the silent majority at the global scale who really want that power and would immediately start using it if it was made available to them. And I also want to just point out that everything that's proposed in the paper is actually fairly straightforward and buildable. It probably is already built. 
the question is exactly the question of scaling. How, does, how do we get this to the billions of people who would actually benefit from it? Um, and, you know, and also the corruptibility aspect of people hacking it. So, so it may be built, but it may not be incorruptible, as was said. So anyway. Well, there was the question of scaling, but I think like going back to the beginning, uh, Ed's uh, critique was more, it was a question of adoption in the first place, because mm -hmm. if you have all these people using other systems that incentivize them in various ways through, you know, just the experiences that they could have there of connecting to other people, you have a net network effect there, right? You have to reverse that network effect in some way. Some, you have to tip the balance of attention so that people are putting it into the network that is more decentralized, more egalitarian, uh, you know, more respective of individual sovereignty, et cetera. And like what I think that the, you know, the creators of the C in blockchain and in, um, you know, the, these liquid democracy systems is the ability to create a network theoretically anyway, and at least at a small scale at the organization scale, you know, with, the hope that it could scale up to the to the planetary level, but the ability to create a network that um, is shaped around different incentives, right? It's shaped around people that don't want to squander their attention and time and you know ba mental bandwidth on meaningless likes or meaningless clicks or uh, unconsciously filtering out advertisements or being manipulated like pawns in these grand global kind of disinformation campaigns that get played out over corporate networks. Like, is there a way to protect against that so that our time, attention, and co cognitive capacity is used in more self, in a good sense, in the best sense, self-serving ways, uh, rather than ways that serve the owners of those centralized networks? Can we own our own network, we being human beings in general? And, uh, you know, that doesn't have to come at the expense of or instead of the sidewalk and what I think Johnny is talking about. But I, I do think that it takes some, it takes what would be called culture. Uh, and I would just want to make one more comment and I'll, I'll pass it off. But uh, there was a paper written, I brought this up in previous conversations by John Dewey in 1938 or 39 called Creative Democracy. And Dewey was a theorist of democracy. Uh, he was, you know, hopeful about the American democratic experiment because he saw in it a, a tradition uh, which, of course, has not, you know, been fully realized and has degraded significantly uh, over the years, but a tradition of a culture of dem democratic practice. He sees, cult he sees democracy as not just a system of votes and uh, verifying identities, et cetera, but as, as a way of life. And that is the hard, that's the hard, slow road, because you don't just get people to adopt a new way of life overnight. Like, there, you need some paths for, for them to take. And then the technology can assist and can be more adequate to that way of life um, than, you know, the current technology. But unless we have a way of re rethinking how we live, uh, then, uh, which I think is what we're doing. So um, like that, that's, that's the point of like this, this conversation mm -hmm. I think, is to reflect on that aspect of the problem. Like I'm not going to figure out the computer science, but this group here and others like it can, can think about the other dimensions that would be, would have to be the case for the computer science to even, you know, be, mean something. So that's my, that's my two votes. <laughs> or point zero zero two votes if, if, if that's how radical it radical affordances and radical practice i actually had right before you said that marco i had written down because i'm kind of i like to process while writing as well so i wrote um and if this has been my premise as a cooperative business developer and as a systems designer is that is essentially that nothing exists except in practice i wrote nothing is perceived except when held in sentient attention and nothing exists except in practice. We've, we've, got a, we've got a practice. And practicing is a behavioral act. It's a shaping act. Like we, we, our personalities and our identities are shaped through feedback of action and then 
you know, observing the response in the environment, observing our own response internally. Um, so I think so much about, yeah, what we practice and what we modeled and what is modeled to us and how do we, how can we have freedom within a system where certain values or things are consistently modeled? Like, are, do we become that or is there some freedom within that um, to explore and play alternative experiences? So, yeah. I had a quick remark about um, but this idea that technology affects us. So I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Um, I think the question that I was raising was that there are obvious ways it affects us and there are less obvious ways that it affects us. And it's the less obvious ones that worry us. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is the internet isn't a technology. The internet is a medium it's a medium built out of technology or partly mm -hmm. built out of technology, but it's a medium. So it's a very different kind of thing than technology. I think we just need to be a little bit aware of that, that some of the things we're talking about aren't technologies in the same way as other things that we're talking about. I'm not quite sure how that... Could you, that. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, on um, um, what you mean by medium? I mean, I like it. I just want you to space give us interaction, right? It's a space for interaction. Um, and it has a million different technologies that support or, 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 mm -hmm. or enable. But of course, the social networks, when I say the social networks are part of the internet, but the social networks are not just the technology that supports the networking, but the people who are doing the networking. Mm -hmm. And the internet is much about people as it is about the the protocols and the channels and you know all of that kind of level so it's not a technology in the same way a smartphone is a technology you know it is a tangible technology and there are many different technologies in it but it's a, it's a technology it's not a space in the same way that the internet is right so i just think we need to be a little bit careful about how we use the terms of it yeah. The, the smartphone is a portal to the space, isn't it? <laughs> uh, mine isn't. <laughs> <laughs> mine doesn't work that way. Yes, <laughs> uh, mine's just a phone too, John. <laughs> but it's, it's, I mean, the internet is a communication, it's a communicational medium for sure. And um, how, what are our access points to communication? Are the these technologies are the devices that enable the, the virtualized communication. Listening to the film, um, which we're going to talk about next week, um, ha has changed my understanding of what a smartphone is. So mm -hmm. uh, I thought of a smartphone as being a little bit like you were kind of an influencer. But, but the problem with the smartphones, the way they're designed, is they have this app system built into them. And what I retain from the film is that, I mean, and it's what I said in my, in my post about it. What is an app? It's a slot machine mentality given a utilitarian wrapping, mm -hmm. but it's still a slot machine underneath. And what we've done is we've put slot machines everywhere, systematically through everything in all of our mobile, mobile lives. And it's the slot machine mentality that is going, which is destroying us. Mm. And, but that's, but that's the because... <laughs> well, does the smartphone have to have the slot machine structure builds in the way they are done, done today? I think it's hard to tease them apart. But, but that's because a group of people organized into a corporation has de built, the, built that app in order to achieve a desired result. In this case, the consolidation, the aggregation of people's attention on it mm -hmm. in order to serve them advertisements, which are then paid for by advertisers. So it satisfies a business model and that business model satisfies the people who are using that model to profit and to gain or maintain power. So, I mean, part of, I think the subtext uh, and that, you know, it's just barely under the surface of this paper. And what's 
even exciting about it is has to do with that that play uh that dimension of how could we because people got clever essentially some people got clever faster than others and figured out how to hack the systems in order to accumulate a lot of power through accumulating money so now we've figured out what they've done now it's open knowledge they're talking about it at the you know the world economic forum like we see that this is a problem because on the whole in agri it's not gonna it's not sustainable we've in, they, you know mark zuckerberg may have good intentions but vladimir putin may not have good intentions and vladimir putin can play mark zuckerberg to uh, you know, to pursue his ends now i think that problem persists even if you have a, a system like this because as soon as you have a new dominant system all the wolves are going to come out to figure out how they can game it uh, for their own ends. So we get back to the cultural problem. We get back to the human dimension of, of you know, the drama of politics mm -hmm. and the magic and the mythic dimensions of people playing out, uh, you know, their mm -hmm. own particular psychoses on a mass scale. And, and that's the medium. So the medium. We're well, that happens via the medium. So, yeah, we're the medium. We're vibrating. Um, membranes on our good days <laughs> in our best moments perhaps um, but I think I want to be interacting with your shadow rather than with Google's shadow mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the problem it's not and technology if you interact with it enough you will come and t you will have to develop a relationship to the shadow Mm -hmm. of the technology um but see i just don't think it's more the sh technology that's going to self-correct without a human presencing that calls the shots i think humans should be deciding um who gets to make a decision about the topic here or who is going to take turns talking when uh, excuse me, I may want to interrupt you, but then maybe I won't next time and you can interrupt me and we can deal with each other's narcissistic egos wanting to grab attention. <laughs> you know? But you and I should be doing that and sorting it out, not the goddamn computer, you know, uh, and that's where my frustration is because I want the human presence to be primary and we can, and I believe we've demonstrated, use this technology um, in 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 different ways and i think we can we then can an, an accelerated process may start to occur as we become more attuned to how this technology works um, so that it's not editing us in ways that we don't want to be edited or mediated in ways we don't want to be mediated um, that there will be an acceleration that happens uh, of a give and a take and you know, I can deal with your shadow, you can deal with mine, and we can also see each other's light, the light that's coming through our, our, in spite of our shadows. And so it gets much more complex. And who knows, out of that, many of those kinds of experiments that we've been conducting here and elsewhere, we may be able to create a new, um, new politics. And the technology will, we can, we can sponsor the technology that we need to make that happen. I'd like to give an example that may seem tangential again, but um, going back to the slot machine mentality, like chess, I, I love playing chess. I used to play with friends close up, and now I'm constantly down, uh, downloading the app and deleting it a day after I get it, the online chess game, because I play one minute chess games. And it's not about skill, but it's about speed and it, it, it's it's slot machine mentality and this isn't necessarily technology that was figured out oh how are we gonna get these guys addicted to chess it's just something some person thought of let's play chess faster and it, it's fun but then to a certain extent you're sitting there constantly playing games and the long-term thought process is no longer there so i, I delete it because <laughs> i don't want it to be there any longer and um I guess, I don't know if my metaphor is going to check out, but going to Deep Blue and the technology around the game in general, like it's, we're basically all just playing games 
in a certain sense, not chess games, but the game of life. And we can, we see technology looming in the distance and right, we can, we, we need to learn how to work with it in a certain sense. We can use technology, like maybe the grandmasters will use the one minute game to speedily learn out how this works, but then it goes back to the human aspect of when they actually sit down at a table and play a game and they can have that in mind while still with that person. So it's, it's everything all at once. It's, it's, it's wild. Um, so it's, it is difficult to figure out where to go with all this. I, I think I took us back off track here from what you were saying, John, but um, like there's quite a bit going on and it is hard to see where these smartphones tie in the technology side and what we really want. And there's, there's groups forming such as our group here. There's companies forming only solely online around the world globally. And to rein in all that, we, here we are. I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> I would just quickly make the argument that that the technology could be serving the human ends that like John's talking about. Uh, if we're talking about voting systems and the current technology that we have is voting every four years for president, every couple of years for Congress, uh, you know, having no say essentially on, you know, all the issues that crop up in, in between, you know, uh, which tend to be influenced by lobbyists who are paying the, you know, we don't have to re rehash all that, but if you have the app, and an issue were to come up, like, should we allow the uh, Trans-Pacific Pipeline to go through um, Native American territory? And people could register a vote on that uh, through their app. And after a you know, process of public discussion, debate, and all the shenanigans and the theatrics that would go as a part of that, eventually you would be able to, you would have the cryptographically guaranteed right to register your vote on that issue or to delegate it to somebody else. Uh, and, uh, and then that's how the decision would be made. But at whatever the outcome, it may be a good outcome, maybe a bad outcome. Just because you have li liquid democracy doesn't mean that the population might not vote to bomb Hiroshima. They might, if that issue were to come up and if it were like on the blockchain and an executable contract, so that you know, when the vote occurs automatically, you know, the nuclear button is, is pressed because you know, nobody can stop it. Like, all right, that would be the nightmare scenario I think that John is uh, concerned about, or one, one of which. But in practice, if we were just to grant that this is feasible, assume maybe it takes 100 years, wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't that better serve our humanity uh, rather than this abstraction away from us through the representative system of the 18th century? If we had 100 years, I wouldn't be worried about anything. <laughs> yeah. Quite relaxed. yeah, I know. But even if we don't join, I don't think we have a hundred years. Yeah, but that—that's. I think that's beside the point that, that Marco's making. Yeah. Um, the the point is that it's nice. I have to. I have to go back to something that Emma Goldman once said. If voting made a difference, they'd make it illegal. And that's that's before any system, whether you put your little mark on a piece of paper or whether you do it over your smartphone, it's whether you're allowed to even speak to that. And I think it's becoming evident, you know, what we're doing here is a lot different than what's happening on Facebook. And, and it is different qualitatively because we actually reflect upon what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it, where there, that reflection is not welcome like it don't like it click it don't click it whatever but in the end it's it's how we think about it, how we perceive it and how we we implement it and and we can we can think in in planetary terms and we can think it would it, it would be wonderful if everybody had a say in what we're doing but one of the consequences one of the real consequences of that is as you pointed out marco we could vote to bomb Hiroshima. That's also one of the outcomes. This is exactly the topic that came up in the, the Aurobindo thread 
in one of the posts that, uh, uh, you know, the new, the new totalitarians and the will of the people. He spoke about this as well. It's, it's all, it all happens in our minds in the end. And how we decide to implement our own understanding of the reality that we encounter. And my curmudgeonry comes from the fact that I don't think that most people that I know, and you, you folks are really grand exceptions to the rule, are people I would be willing to trust with those kinds of decisions. But I have to entrust them with them if I'm going to be a democratic individual and think democratically. I have to let them have their say. And I can, and I'm sure, and there's the curmudgeon will now speak again, it will end badly. Because we're not stopping to think. I'm coming back to John, we are not reflecting on what we're doing. We are. I'm just saying that we is the general we. That's not happening. They're not, we're not thinking about this critically. We're not thinking about this in terms of well, what could be the possible benefits and what's the fallout? That's, that's the problem we're faced with. This can be mediated by the internet or the telephone or just face to face. It doesn't really matter to me. That's where, that's why I say technology itself is foundationless. It doesn't matter whether we're on the porch or whether we're here. This is as good as being on the porch as I can get right now. So it works. This is the Dewey and pragmatism that's in there as well. But it all happens in our heads or in our hearts or in our beings. And that's where I have the problem. The technology can do nothing, nothing about that. It doesn't help us think better. It doesn't help us think more ethically. It doesn't help us think more positively. It simply provides us a mean with, at present, with communicating our feelings about these things. But it's not in the technology, it's in ourselves. And that's where we have to really start. And I don't see where all the talk, I think that all the talk about technology, this is why I'm a curmudgeon about it, distracts from that. Because we talk about the technological possibilities. I don't give a shit. The fact that I can speak to you now is all that's important. I don't care how we do it. That's not important. The how is not as important as the that. And we ignore the that because we come and become enamored with the how. That's, that's the, the thing in all of this that you know, it boils down in the end to us. We have to do something about ourselves. And that's the biggest challenge any of us are ever going to face. I think. My curmudgeonly two cents. Well, I get a drill. Uh, I'm very disturbed by the idea of government by referendum. I mean, <laughs> as, a gay person, as a gay person, one referendum after another. Oh, yeah. Stopped gay rights from equality before the law. Yeah. We were the only legally discriminated group. There we we legally discriminated against my almost my entire adult life was distorted by some of the stupidest people who ever lived and and they voted by referendum so there's no guarantee that a person can take multiple perspectives balance the short term with the long term connect to a vision that he or she may not see the benefits of in their lifetime there's no guarantee of that at all. Just because, you know, but I'm, I am saying that it's way too complex. And I, I think the vote, uh, governance by referendum um, would be a really bad idea if you're a minority. And I loved the Supreme Court when it overturned the sodomy laws. Uh, the Supreme Court justice, I can't remember his name, but he said, he apologized to gay people and said the law should never be used by a group against another group because they do not like that group. Mm -hmm. And that was the first day, the first day in my whole fucking life, I felt like I was an American. <laughs> my, there was a shift in my identity at the level of my identity. I was a different person the next day. 
and months afterwards, I could feel every day, I could feel the, sh the weight that had been on my shoulders since I was a 10 year old was gone. And I felt the muscles in my body were getting more and more relaxed. The muscles were in my chest, the feeling in my, the tightness in my gut, my physiology started to change. So that's how I think the, the law is a, is a powerful force. And if there's good laws, I think that's a good thing. Bad laws are really, really bad for people. And I think it was, I can't remember the justice's name, but he said good laws, he said, people will obey a good law even if they don't like it. But if the, if the law is really bad, eventually it's going to, it's going to unravel. Mm -hmm. It may take several lifetimes. You know, and the people who work to change that law may not live to see that change. But I think, you know, that's part of the, the gift of being a good citizen and just knowing you did, you did the best that you could and that others are going to benefit from that. I think you're going to have a better time on when you're on your deathbed looking, at, looking back on what that life was all about. You know, that I think um, points to one of the maybe uh, blinds, one of the lacks in, in, in this paper. One thing that could be added to it to make it stronger, I would say, that would be compatible with the voting system and everything. Because what you're talking about, John, is the fact that there is a constitution that, yeah. that set forth the axioms, the first principles, the first philosophy of the system whatever the votes are going to be, they can't violate those fundamental axioms. Uh, and, you know, in the American system, those principles can be interpreted differently by different courts and as times mm -hmm. change, but they're there. And uh, I think that they're not, they're here too, but they're not explicit. And there isn't really an accounting for how something like that, how those kinds of protections, those kinds of limits, perhaps even on the, the uh, extent of the, the liquidity in the democracy. Uh, like it needs to actually have some structure as well, not just the liquidity. And the structure would come from uh, a grand narrative and from a defining set of values that you have to agree with if you're gonna be on that system. And you have to understand that whatever your votes are, they're not gonna end up bombing Hiroshima. Uh, but that is a whole nother ball of wax as far mm -hmm. as uh, you know, a, a kind of lift. That's a bigger theoretical lift mm -hmm. than figuring out, you know, which tech, which blockchain you're going to use or, or what have you. Um, but I don't think it's too much of a lift. I mean, we've had thousands of years of experience now in human organizations and systems. Like, I think we have a relatively good idea of what values are most likely to work on a larger scale. Uh, and, and it would be a matter of just a making those explicit and putting them into the into the system uh so i don't see it i don't in other words i i i i, I totally i hear you and, and and i feel what you're saying uh but i i on the to uh to defend what the, these folks are doing i think that uh i think it could be accounted for in what they're proposing So one of the things that um, I was slightly disappointed with the article was that I got quite, I got, I read this bit, I can't find the text now, I was looking for it, but um, this idea that um, it's not the least common denominator, that somehow they would be awaiting towards people who had things to say that were somehow better or more moral or something, and and it wouldn't be just a state referendum kind of thing. But when you actually look at the reputation thing in the paper, what they end up saying is, well, reputation comes from belonging to an organization and the organization acquires the reputation and passes it over to the individuals. And that looks to me like, oh, the power structures are back, the ones being with the, you know? So it seems to me that it's just reinforcing the existing structures again. So I, I, yeah. thought, I thought the idea of a reputation was really important, but I didn't like the way it was dealt with. Yeah, and you know, they suggest, I, I saw, my understanding from reading the paper too is that the act of delegation 
empowers some people who have more knowledge or whatever expertise or, or whatever validity to make a decision about something. You, you imbue them with, by, by the transmitting of your votes to them. However, that suggests that people have the self-awareness to recognize that they may not be the most informed about an issue, mm -hmm. and then the humility to hand over their votes. How likely is that to happen in this system as well? It's another thing that came to mind. Well, the Republican Party could be an organization on the system that dedicates their votes to Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Yes. God forbid. They already do, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that already happening in the... Uh... The I mean, but the argument would be that in this kind of a network that's decentralized, distributed, that there'd be less of incentive to do so right. because you're not corrupted by the big money, et cetera. And I, I'm not cl clear enough that that's been addressed myself here, but I'd prefer this to w w what we have now. Um, you know, as, as a sketch uh, as much of a sketch as it is uh, and not yet really a full picture and there is another thing here right because if i understand it right marco you guys are sort of looking at this as a possible backbone for cosmos so we're uh, you know we're discussing this as at the societal level of an election system mm -hmm. for national mm -hmm. government uh, which is one level but as a small model for small governance, I think we should also be looking at that and making a distinction between the two levels, you know? So is this a viable model for a, I mean, you know, I, I know you're not talking about the 50 of us so far in Cosmos, you're thinking about a, a, a future state when there's a bit few more people, but, you know, is this a viable model for a small governance and uh, we haven't really discussed that here right now. Hmm. No, I, I agree. That's, that's a point that I tried to make a little, I tangentially I'll admit if an organization decides to do this, that's one thing and you can play it out to see, well, how does it work and where the king, you know, it's a beta test kind of thing. You prototype it. You, you try to, you try to see where does it work and where does it not so work and, and what needs to be thought about. And out of an experience like that, you can always feed back into a paper like this. There are many fundamentally or fundamental, let's say philosophical issues that are involved we can think about, but, but that is, it's, it is a different kind of thing. Um, even when we discuss it in terms of planetary, whatever it is, we realize, well, there are, we come to certain impasses or certain places where we go, well, maybe that's not such a good idea. And at that point you have to think, well, how do I deal with that? And that's what you would do in the smaller scale. So I, you know, I, I would hate anybody to, to think that I didn't think that the people that put this paper together didn't do a good job of what they were doing. And in light of even all the criticism that I've levied against it, I'm glad that some people have at least brought this forward so that we can sit around and, and, and talk about it and hack on it. You know, that, that, that's the value in and of itself, because it gets us thinking about, well, what does it mean to be democratic and what does it mean to, uh, to want to advocate these kinds of things, even on a larger scale, um, regardless of whether or not we would try to implement something like this on a smaller scale, prototypically. So, you know, those, you know that, that's all important things that come out of this, regardless of how well or how poorly we think they might have done what they've done, they have provided a service and giving us something to talk about that, it, that needs to be talked about. Yeah. Yeah. And in the framing of an organization, um, a small organization, mm -hmm. um, we have the, the freedom to actually be purpose driven and actually mm -hmm. articulate our purpose and also the mechanisms by which we hope to accomplish that purpose. And in the paper, it talks about um, organizations and how any organization that might want to use this protocol um, would would need to have a, or I don't know if they said need or, or are they just suggesting it, but would, would have a constitution in which uh -huh. they articulate what they're all about, what they're trying to accomplish and things like that. And so um, unlike the universe, we do have the freedom as an intentional community of yes. practitioners, a community of practice to say, this is what we're all about. So this is what we're going to try to do with as far as how we set up our systems. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, um, I'm interested in exploring further. And as Jeffrey said, um, it's not something we're looking at right away. It's very much part of the visioning work of visioning cosmos. It's not like uh, any actions are going to be taken immediately. But this as well as Holochain and Marco and I are going to have a meeting on Friday in person where we're going to really try to work out some of the some of the issues because with um, with the alternative currency that we've explored in our models for what cosmos could be that's a certain way of communicating and tokenizing value that's generated in the platform and so what is the intersection between value and reputation and governance and those domains like how you know how do they potentially mix together and the paper kind of touches on that mm -hmm. by exploring how voting can be looked at as an economic proposition as well and so there's the economic the currency aspect of the vote activity um, so it's just it's interesting stuff but very much being being explored that's all that's, we're, we're just exploring aren't we <laughs> exploring here it's all we ever do yeah <laughs> Marco, do you have anything to add to that? Well, if John doesn't have something. Oh, I was just, I was just I'm reading this wonderful uh, historian. I think it's, it's Stephen Wolin. Is his name? Sheldon no. Wolin. Sheldon Wolin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he was, he, I just listened to an interview. He was such a, he's an older statesman kind of guy. Oh, you know? yeah. He just said that um, he thought revolution was anachronistic, hmm. especially when systems are as fragile as they are. Um, so systems evolve if there's enough stability in the system to handle perturbations. But if the, the per, if the if it's too unstable, per, perturbations do not evolve that system. They break down and usually regress right. to right. more primitive levels. And it may take centuries for them to climb back out of that. So that's where I believe there's uh, this, this has been a catalyst reading this paper and sharing our agreements and disagreements um, because I think it does help help us stabilize um, rather than get too caught up in a grand narrative as I tend to do being the radical uh, you know utopian that I am <laughs> <laughs> it's in the nature of the being John <laughs> so I I, I'm, I want to radically reconsider <laughs> <laughs> my own bias um, and so I uh, you know because I, I think we may there just may, may be better techniques that we can we can translate more adequately so that we can create conditions for a transformation to occur but we probably need a phase space where we take a few steps forward a few, a few steps backward a, a few more steps forward a few you know so we have a chance to uh, you know experiment uh, and then I think we may start to uh, uh, see some shifts happen that we're all going to be very proud of so that we can leave that as our legacy rather than um, mud fights and, <laughs> you know, and, and, and rancor and, uh, you know, politics as usual. <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you yeah. for this opportunity today. I really enjoyed it. Well, I have a few remarks. I, there could be my closing remarks and if anyone mm -hmm. else wants to add in. Uh, so, we're in an inter I think we're in an interesting moment because we're kind of inchoate as a, as, an, as a collective. And so we don't really have rules, mechanisms, and systems. They're, they're just implied in what we do and how we do it. Things that I've set up things, patterns that have emerged through our interactions. Uh, and we're also at a point where we don't ultimately, we don't know what this is exactly. We don't know what cosmos is mm -hmm. uh, in the sort of unfold, in its unfolding over, over time. Is it a thousand year project? Is it a 10 year project? Is it billions of people? Is it a few hundred maybe people? What's it doing? Uh, I myself, shift. Sometimes I feel more expansive. Sometimes I feel more, con you know, contracted, protective, more focused. Sometimes it has to do just with my personal, you know, feelings, uh, nothing to do with like, with the bigger thing. I just want to have a certain kind of life. And, you know, what, how does that interface with what the bigger thing is? 
so um, we're, we're just exploring, but at the same time, I think we're learning. And part of feeling into like what these people are doing over here or what this filmmaker is talking about, you know, making, um, uh, talking about over there uh, and other, uh, you know, uh, many other initiatives like this. There's a lot, there are a number of things like this going on. But what, that's one of the surprising things. Once you start researching it, it's just how much is going on, how many different uh, iter versions of the blockchain. There are totally different approaches, uh, for example. There are different approaches to how to set up cooperatives, how to set up platforms. There's th different kinds of thinking around the protocols between platforms. And really, what are we trying to do on the bigger scale? And, and so part of, I think, what I'm trying to feel out through a process like this is, all right, where do we really fit in? Like, what am, where does what somebody like me, who's not a programmer, in this code sense, I'm not going to write Python or, you know, I'm not going to analyze a blockchain, but I can understand something about how these systems kind of fit together in, in a bigger sense. And maybe I have a sensitivity to things that are not being as presenced in, the, in these discourses. And, you know, artists have always used technology to make new art. This is no different than Andy Warhol falling in love with his tape recorder. You know, that the internet is just like the, you know, the quantum tape recorder that lets us all, you know, fall in love more uh, complexly. Uh, and so that's the dimension I'm interested in. And, you know, if it were uh, 50 years ago, we, I, I, we would be talking about um, the new computer facilities, you know, <laughs> where they had people switching the circuits. Uh, and we'd be getting excited about the possibilities of that. But I would be doing it from the artistic perspective because I want to know what can we create with it. And so that's where it gets down to Cosmos. Like this offers me with a bunch of things to think about. Like, hmm, well, how, how might we, how might you fund projects here? Let's say somebody wants to make a film and they want to raise, you know, some money. They mm -hmm. want to find people that want to act, want to produce, want to, how would you do that in a way that's, Fair. and that also produces a good film <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's you know that that's a whole that's a i don't know filmmaking by referendum <laughs> <laughs> well right it doesn't exactly work just like you know <laughs> democracy doesn't necessarily get you the best results so you right. have to know what result you want and you know like i've said before i want glorious poetry mm -hmm. um so but you can't write it by a committee. <laughs> I enjoyed your poem, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. I, I yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's a whole nother ball of wax too. Um, but there are things you do need other people for. And that's what, you know, we don't want to turn to a dysfunctional family and the task that I need to perform, I can't blame you guys if it doesn't get done. <laughs> and I don't want to use the group as a distraction from doing tasks that I need to perform. But I think the, the primary interest I have here is the quality of the relationships, the quality of the attention, the art of, the art of conversation, which seems to be stressed, and that we take enough time to pick up on each other's rhythms and tonalities and Sometimes we get a little long-winded. Sometimes we don't fill out things, fill in the details, but that's okay. We're not going to get anything like this on Facebook, that's for sure. So I believe we are providing an alternative kind of discourse event. Um, and I believe that we're attracting high-quality uh, persons. I'm very impressed by the people that are showing up. And uh, that's what keeps me highly motivated to continue on this journey we're taking together. Because the art form, the lot, I mean, I think it was Goethe said that conversation is the greatest art form. <laughs> so it's a hugely important part of our lives. And if we're just turning into, you know, doing this all day, I, I worry, I worry a lot. But this exchange is like we've had today encourage me that, uh, that we all know how to perform this art. We just need to be given a little support, a little encouragement and, you know, be get and take the risk, you know, that we may say something really stupid. 
<laughs> but we'll be forgiven. <laughs> okay. oh, I pr appreciate everyone taking the risk today. Right, right. So right. next week is the movie? Yeah. Next week's um, movie. What's the name of the movie again? Stare into the light, my pretty. Stare into the light. Oh, God. It's so creepy. Yeah. It is. It is <laughs> creepy. <laughs> It's, yeah, it is. It, it is an absolutely, I, I, I thought, I'm not a big docu fan. I love this one. You know? you know, this one really got me and pulled me in, got me to go, oh, I, I really enjoyed it. You know, it sucked it's, you it, into the screen. Well, yeah, not <laughs> quite. The, yeah, like, there is a bit of a performative contradiction in this film. I'll, I'll, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, my yes, daughter sir. pointed it out. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, love yeah. that stuff. But I think that's part of its charm. You know? Right. <laughs> I love I love the the meta storytelling. Like Exit through the gift shop to me is the ultimate in the film being its own commentary on mm -hmm. the topic that it's about. Yeah, yeah, I love yeah. that. <laughs> I, I love that it's rare that I see uh, a movie where I feel like this pers this film is speaking on my behalf. You know, mm. like, things that I could barely articulate it seemed to just come forward very effortlessly. Great. So I was like, wow, this is great. Cool. So I, I'm teaching a seminar right now on augmented reality and I gave the film to the whole class. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> wow. Sweet. <laughs> Are they going to respond in any way to that? Well, I've had some feedback back. That was, that was easy, so. <laughs> hey, augmented reality. Well, let's yeah. return to that next week. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, it sounds like we're wrapped up. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. It was a lot of fun again. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Time. Appreciate it. <laughs> Appreciate see you next time. time. We'll see Bye. you next one. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye now.